One of the most difficult but necessary skills we need to develop as meditators is how to be judicious without being judgmental. And as a preliminary to developing that skill, it's, it's good to reflect on what the difference is between the two. And to look, look into what being judgmental means. It's basically an effort to get rid of something we don't understand. We see something we don't like and we try to stamp it out. without taking the time to understand it. We just want to get rid of it quickly. So there's an element of impatience in there. Being judicious, however, requires patience. And it requires understanding as well. When you make judicious choices, it's because you've understood both options both sides of the question, and your choice is based on knowledge, not on desire or aversion. This is why the Buddha, in his analysis of suffering, that in the Four Truths, said that the, our task with regard to the first truth, which is the truth of suffering or stress, is that we comprehend it. Because all too often we treat pain in the same way we treat anything we don't like. We want to get rid of it as fast as possible, without taking the time to understand it. And what we're learning as we practice is the patience and uh, the skills we need in order to stop and take a, look at, a good long look at things that we don't like inside ourselves so we can deal with them judiciously, so we can deal with them through understanding. So as we meditate, it means giving space to these things, so we can watch them, so we can understand them. So that when we finally decide that they really are unskillful and there are things that we don't really want to have going on in our mind, we understand how to do it neatly, effectively. Because the problem with being judgmental is that it's not effective. We try to stamp out things here and they go springing up someplace else, like that old movie, The Thing. It would go underground and suddenly spring up someplace else. You cut off one head here, one identity here, and it, but it has tentacles, it has underground roots. It springs up someplace else. That's what happens when we try to get rid of something, but don't understand its roots, don't understand where it's coming from. But being judicious is more effective. We see what's really skillful, what's unskillful in the mind. We learn how to disentangle the two, because many times the things that we don't like in our, in, within ourselves actually do have some good to them, but we don't notice it. We focus instead on what we don't like or what we're afraid of. Just try, try to stamp it all out. So as we meditate, we learn to step back a bit. This is what concentration practice is for, is to give us a comfortable center, at least some place in our awareness where we can rest, where we feel less threatened by things. When we feel less threatened and less oppressed, then we have the strength to be more patient, to look into what's going on in the mind, and develop the proper attitudes towards what's skillful and what's unskillful. And this is what the, where the four sublime attitudes come in. I remember reading a book one time about Buddhism. This was way back in the 70s. And the author tried to organize everything around the Four Noble Truths, but then couldn't figure out how the four sublime attitudes fit into all this. It just didn't seem to connect someplace, or any place at all. 
but actually they underlie the whole underlie the whole practice. You have to have a sense of goodwill to be even interested in the question of suffering, the question of trying to understand suffering, because you want to find an effective way of dealing with it. Because you have goodwill for yourself, you want to be happy. So we try to use that thought as a way of developing that center that we need in order to rest. Find a place where you can be happy. If you don't have that basic sense of goodwill, it's hard to stir up the energy needed to master the concentration, to keep with the breath, keep coming back to the breath. No matter how many times you wander off, you just keep coming back. And even though you may want to be more advanced than this, you sit down and bang, there it is, first jhana. And then when it doesn't happen that way, you get frustrated. Well, just put that frustration aside. Put away all the, the pride and the opposite, and the shadow side of pride, which is a shame. Just put those things aside. Say, this is the way it is. And be willing just to keep coming back. Stick with those simple tasks. The people who master any kind of skill are the ones who are willing to step back and master the simple, the simple stuff. Get it really good, because it's in doing the simple stuff and being observant while you do it that you learn an awful lot. It's not just a mechanical process that you have to get through as quickly as possible. Pay attention to what you're doing. Even when things are not going well, pay attention to how the mind slips off. Pay attention to how you bring it back. And you'll learn an awful lot right there. So goodwill has to underlie this. If there's a sense of frustration, remember, you're here because of goodwill, not for the sake of frustration, not for the sake of finding some new thing to beat your, yourself over the head about or to be judgmental about. You're here for the sake of goodwill, for the sake of giving the mind a place where it can be at ease. You develop compassion for yourself. Think of all the suffering that you could be causing yourself if you weren't meditating. All the suffering you might be causing others if you weren't meditating. And this helps to remind you that even when things are not going all that well, it's better than most of the things that people do in their lives. It's a good, useful use of your time. Then there's a quality of sympathetic joy, appreciating the happiness that you can develop, appreciating the happiness of others. Of all the four sublime attitudes, this is the one that gets the least press. And oftentimes it's the one that's hardest to develop. There seem to be voices in our heads that resent happiness, either resenting the happiness of other people, or other people have resented our happiness and we've picked up that voice someplace. And so we have to counter it by realizing there's nothing wrong with happiness. It comes through our actions. The fact that someone is experiencing happiness right now, if it doesn't seem to be coming from present actions, well, there must be past actions. that have brought it about. And an attitude of resentment doesn't help anything at all. Sometimes it seems unfair that some people are happy and other people are not. The question of fairness or unfairness, just put it aside. Whether well, it's a sense of well-being in the mind, learned how to appreciate that sense of well-being. It has its uses. Most people, when they get happiness, they, they get complacent, and this is one of the reasons why happiness gets a bad press, the happiness of people who have power, say, or have beauty or have wealth. They get complacent and, as a result of their happiness, start doing very unskillful things. But if you approach it from the attitude of someone who's practicing, as the Buddha said, there is a use for happiness. It's a quality in the mind, if it's properly used, it can bring about peace of mind. If 
after all, the concentration that we're looking for in our practice has to have some basis of well-being, otherwise the mind wouldn't be able to stay there. So if you learn how to use it properly, then it has no drawbacks. The Buddha, when he was practicing those years and years in the forest, tormenting himself, torturing himself, he probably he had a very unhealthy attitude towards happiness. He was afraid of it. And it took a while for him to bring himself around to the point where he could actually practice jhana, practice good states of concentration, because he was afraid of happiness. He was afraid of pleasure, afraid that it would lead to all kinds of bad things in the mind. It was only by carefully looking at it and realizing that there was nothing to fear, there were no drawbacks there, that he was able to give himself wholeheartedly to the practice. It's good to reflect that whatever issues we have in the practice, the Buddha went through them all. So it's not like there's something specially wrong with us. These are natural human tendencies. Because the Buddha was a human being, he had to overcome natural human tendencies as well. So we're in good company. And there's the attitude of equanimity, which is useful in many ways. When we're doing working here in the meditation, the results aren't coming as fast as we'd like them to. Equanimity teaches patience. It reminds us many, that many times. The principle of action requires that things take time. And so if you're working on something that takes time, you try to develop equanimity. That makes it easier to be patient, realizing that things, that things don't necessarily have to go the way you want them to right away. When you're willing to admit the situation for what it is, then you can actually act more effectively with it. Again, it's a matter of being patient, taking the time to understand what's going on. So when we work at these attitudes and bring them to the meditation, we find that it's, they create a sense of patience, a sense of well-being, an ability to work at a task that requires time. A task that sometimes seems to require that we do mindless things, just bring the mind back to the breath, bring the mind back to the breath. Why? Don't ask questions right now, just bring the mind back to the breath. But be observant while you do it, because as you catch the mind going off, you learn very interesting things. And you see that there's a point where you can see it beginning to move and you have the choice to go with it or not. Once you catch yourself at that point, then it's a lot easier to stay with the breath. Then there's a the whole question of when you do find yourself wandering off, how do you bring the mind back? Do you bring it back in a judgmental way or a judicious way? Can you try other ways? If you find that it's in sort of a judgmental way, well, can you find other ways of simply bringing it back without all the unnecessary extra baggage? Just very matter-of-factly, bring it back and leave it there. Leave it at that. Just this simple process in and of itself teaches you a lot of lessons about the difference between being judgmental and being judicious. In other words, you try to understand, you try to look for patterns. So that the way you order the mind around or try to create some sense of control in here is actually effective. The whole the reason control freaks have a bad reputation is because they're ineffective, they're judgmental. They're not judicious in how they control things. This doesn't mean that control is bad, it simply it has to be again, like passing being judicious. It has to be being judicious. It has to be done skillfully. And that takes time. It takes your powers of observation. Watch what you're doing, watch what the results are. When things don't work, admit the fact and try something else. When you do this, you find it easier and easier to tell the difference between 
being judgmental and being judicious. At the same time, you start getting better results from your, from your meditation, because you've taken the time to watch, to observe, to understand what's going on. One of the main problems in modern life is that people have so little time. So they want to cram as much as possible in, in terms of their meditation into little bits and pieces of time. And that, of course, aggravates the whole problem of being judgmental. Keep reminding yourself that meditation is a long-term project. And when you have a sense of that long arc of time, it's a lot easier to sit back and just work very carefully at the basic steps. It's like learning any skill, trying to be a tennis player, say, if you want to gain all the skills you're going to need to be a good tennis player in one afternoon, you end up doing all of them very sloppily. And don't get the results you want. But if you realize this may take time, let's work on one skill at a time here. How do you keep your eye on the ball? How do you swing the racket? Take it apart step by step by step and be willing to work on small things like this bit by bit by bit so you really understand them deep down in your bones. So when the time comes to make choices, they're judicious choices, not judgmental choices. And you get the results you want. 